Wallace Thorne here talking right now at the EU 2015 about matter and mass. And this is, um, well, I'll just let you listen to it. Talk about matter and mass. So the second step on the path to discovery about what gravity really is, is to look at the particles that make up matter. Newton's law multiplies the masses of two objects together, so the first requirement is to define what is meant by mass. All right, so now it's he's looking at the particles that make up matter. And this is, the electric universe is is definitely a more accurate model to what's going on in the in the universe. However, in my opinion, Thunderbolt's project, which is a great project, is still couched in atomic language, Newtonian and Einsteinian language. For example, electron, proton, neutron, nucleus. Um, that language, the language known as particle, for example. That kind of language is not really prevalent in the EU, um, the electric universe. So I'll go into that here in a second, but let's listen to what he says. Newton's law multiplies the masses of two objects together, so the first requirement is to define what is meant by mass. The electron is defined as a fundamental indivisible particle. Okay, let's stop right there. The electron is defined as a fundamental indivisible particle. Just like the atom, by definition. So this is, this is why I'm calling this, this whole topic up for people to, to think about. You can open up a Physics 101 book, and by definition, the definition of an atom is the smallest indivisible particle in the universe. And then they'll turn around and tell you that they can split that open and then there's more smaller particles inside of the atom. Now they're saying the same thing about the electron. The electron is defined as a fundamental indivisible, cannot divide it, particle. So you can see right here a contradiction in terms. Either atomic physics needs to change their definitions and be, be honest and go, oh, an atom is not the smallest fundamental fundamental particle that's not that's indivisible in the universe because we are saying we've cut it open, we've divided it. So you got to change your definition. Otherwise, everything you s use in that language is going to be uh, fundamentally inaccurate. So here he's saying an electron is is uh, defined as a fundamental indivisible particle, but what I would say uh, when reading Walter Russell, and and he's not the only one, but just, you know, I'm referencing him, um, he would say that the electron doesn't exist. And so I, I'm going with that because no one's ever seen an electron. No one's ever held an electron, just like no one's ever seen an atom. No one's ever held an atom. And what what I'm trying to get through to you, if you're listening, is that They'll use terms like, well, we're firing electrons out of an electron gun, and we're going to pass it through a, you know, a hadron collider or into some space where we can contain it and then uh, split it apart and or explode it. But an electron gun does not shoot electrons. This is important. An electron gun shoots a current, an electric current. So there's, they're not shooting little balls, they're not shooting particles, they're not shooting electrons, these little divisions. They're actually shooting a stream of electric current, which you could just say is electricity. This is why the electric universe makes much more sense. Okay, going on. Must be a composite of smaller orbiting charged particles, shown here in blue, uh, to store energy. The energy is stored by the motion of those charged particles with respect to one another and also with respect to all other particles in the universe. Okay, did you hear that? They're trying to figure out how matter, a physical object, stores energy. And they're basically saying that the only way we know that it has energy to begin with is because it's in motion. So we're measuring its, its movement. 
and we're detecting its uh, the way that it affects all other objects in the sea of movement or in the in the cosmos if you want to say that so basically what I'm saying here that is is fundamental is that if the if the objects that we're supposedly detecting were not moving then they would have no stored energy so the only way in which an electron for example would have stored energy according to Wallace Thornhill here is because it's in motion. Now this is a big leap for people but hopefully you'll follow me. If you read Walter Russell uh, or check out the, the video I have, um, the two videos I have on, on light and how light moves throughout the universe, Walter Russell says that all motion is actually an illusion. We only a, a it only appears to our senses as if it's moving. It's an undulation of electric lines of force which are in a wave form. So it's an undulation of waves throughout the entire cosmos. And so we see them or we sense them as movement. And so the whole point here is that if Walter Russell is right, then all motion cannot be detected without light and all motion is an illusion. So this is actually why, and I hope you're following me here, this is why light is technically the fastest thing in the universe because it's actually not moving at all. It's, you have to think of it like this, if the cosmos contains stuff it is not a container. It doesn't have a body. The universe doesn't have walls. It doesn't have a body that is containing this soup of energy. The universe is infinite. It has no boundaries. So something that has no boundaries has no reference point in which to sense time or movement because movement is only sensed in temporality. It's only sensed through time. So what that means is you have to see an object in one location and then you have to see it change in another location and the distance or time in between those locations is what we reference as movement. So Walter Russell is saying that light already is everywhere infinitely. It's omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. And if that's true, it's infinite, which means it has no boundaries, which means it's actually completely still. So the reason why light is the barometer for the fastest thing in the world is because it's everywhere, always. And it's not moving from here to there. We only perceive that because we, in our limited awareness, are locked in the idea of time. We see time in our mind's eye. But if we were able to shift our awareness into higher states of consciousness, which lots of people do, they, they end up becoming timeless and boundless. This is kind of like what it's like to go outside your body. You connect to everything that is and thus you transcend time. That's why transcendental meditation is called transcendental because you're transcending your idea of yourself and what you sense. So you're actually transcending your temporality. And when you do that, you're tapping into the infinite. When you're tapping into the infinite, you are not moving. Matter of fact, you're completely still. So, coming back to this, all motion is illusion we can only sense it because there's light and all motion is born from stillness. So stillness actually is the fundamental property or essence or thing in the universe and it gives birth to everything else. It gives birth to bodies, it gives birth to energy, it gives birth to form, it gives birth to light, it gives birth to motion even if these things are illusory.
Okay, so the point is, is that mass is not found in an object based on its weight or density. Let me repeat that. Mass is not found in an object based on its weight or density. This is where Newton went wrong. Kepler was right. Mass is the area of an object times its inertia or movement the energy that it's moving through and the energy that's moving around it. So mass is not defined in terms of its of, of weight or density. I would say that a more accurate way to define mass would be intensity. I know that sounds strange, but you have to think about it in energetic terms we see a physical object or we sense a physical object which we know is vibrating on levels that we can't see those vibrations have different levels of wave uh, wave undulation like different frequencies of waves and if the frequencies are incredibly tight and close together the object appears to us and we sense it as being material or physical if those waves or frequencies are stretched out and they're much more there's much more distance between the, the crests and the troughs of the wave pattern then things seem more ethereal like an aura an energy body um, your mind for example we all agree that we we have access to mind but mind is not something we can see it's something we sense we know is there we use it but it's not something that we see the reason why we don't see it is because it's not contained in the same kind of intensity as a physical object. So think about it like that. If I vibrate something super duper fast, it's going to become physical. And uh, so I would say that mass has m nothing to do with density or weight. It has everything to do with intensity or the intensity of the, of the energy of the wave pattern that is making it up. All right, going on. The same goes for all subatomic particles. It doesn't matter what it is, including the neutrino. The neutrino also is included. And there was a report that I got uh, yesterday that they have now shown that the neutrino has mass. Now, the very idea that it didn't have mass meant that it couldn't have been a real particle anyway because there was no such thing as a particle with no mass. The problem then was that, according to the standard particle, or standard model of uh, subatomic particles, uh, the neutrino doesn't interact with the Higgs field, as it's called. That meant that there was something seriously wrong with the standard model. So what has happened, they've said, this gives us the opportunity to modify the standard model. In other words, please send more money. <laughs> okay, so there's a lot going on there. The Higgs field, uh, according to the Electric Universe model, is totally inaccurate. It's false. There is no Higgs boson particle. Um, there is no Higgs field. Um, and it's ridiculous to even to even say the terms like God particle. God is not bound in a body. God is not bound up in a little ball. It's not a particle. God is everything that is interconnected to everything else. It's all com consciousness. It's omniscient. By definition, it's whatever you call it doesn't matter. But by definition, God is basically everything, right? Transcendent omniscient, all-powerful, all-knowing. So how could you possibly reduce that to a little particle? Uh, if you did, what's all the stuff on the outside of the particle? If it's not, if God is inside the particle, what's all the stuff on the outside? See, this is where syntax and language starts to control people's thinking. And you have to call a spade a spade. And it's ridiculous to say something like God particle. It's just it's not reasonable or rational rational at all so you have to take the walls off 
you have to take the, the limitations off, you have to take the boundaries off if you're going to reach infinity or transcendental states or just simply higher states or more, more inclusive states of awareness. And this is what all the great mystical traditions have done. And science is just our modern mystical tradition. However, it's used so much for profit. It's used so much to make explosive-based technology and explosive-based energy that uh, it's a farce. Because the people that are propping up these, this philosophy we call atomic physics or quantum mechanics, they're just motivated by money. So they're propping up all kinds of stories that, that, that don't make sense. And Wallace Thornhill right, right now is calling him out. And I'm just using him to explain um, further into where the EU gets its roots. The Electric Universe model. There's other people out there, but I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm well studied in Walter Russell, so I go with Russellian science. But people out there should look at D.B. Larson. He wrote a book called A Case Against the Nuclear Atom, which basically is saying exactly what I'm saying right now, only way better than I'm saying it. Is, is he destroys the notion that there is a nuclear atom. He also destroys the notion that the sun is a nuclear furnace. Um, and that's a whole other topic. So the idea here, he, he said, Wallace Thornhill said that neutrinos were thought to have no, no mass. And then now they come and say, oh, we've measured mass in there. So I'll jump ahead here and I'll say, Another definition that physics needs to change is uh, the definition of a photon, right? This is a particle of light, right? So again, a light, light that's traveling across infinity is bound up in a shell or a body or a ball. You got to get over this. The definition, by definition of a photon, has no volume and no mass, so I'm, I'm calling out the physicists of the world and go, how can you tell me that there is a body that contains nothing inside of it? By definition, a body contains stuff. It contains something. So there's no such thing as a body that has no volume and no mass. It's not a body. So, what I would say is, a photon is not a particle. It is a wave. And you can check out my videos that I did uh, on the movement of light, and it talks a little bit about um, the double slit experiment. And Walter Russell talks about that as well. And basically says it's a, it's a matter of language, and it's a matter of the way you view it. So, technically, photons are not particles. They are waves, electric lines of force, electric currents throughout the universe. And they're not bound up in any kind of body. They are just undulations. It's kind of like uh, energy waves. Okay, going on. The electron is defined, as I said, as a fundamental indivisible particle. And it goes for all subatomic particles. And this simple repeated atomic model is at a far smaller scale. Remember the ping pong ball in the middle of that ground and the flea on the outside? That means within those tiny objects, there's also spinning charged smaller objects. Who is to say where we stand in the cosmic scale of things? Now, Ralph Sansbury, who was the fellow I mentioned earlier, who published this idea of electron structure, um, showed that you could actually derive the magnetic force from this structure. In other words, it's a, a version of the electric force. And gravity from this structure is an, another weak form of the electric force. So here we are, we're doing what... Okay, did you hear that? Um, the guy he's quoting, I think his name's Ralph Sansbury. He's talking about gravity, and he's basically saying that in detecting gravity, it's pretty much impossible not to um, use the terms of electricity when talking about gravity. Same with, same with talking about magnetism. Um, the reason why this is is because the universe is electric in nature. 
So gravity is a misnomer, and this is a hard one for people to wrap their mind around, but check out the interview with Robert Otey. There's a bunch of them online. You check out mine, check out others, check out Red Ice Radios. Robert Otey um, showing how what we call gravity is actually a symptom of electricity. And so it, the reason why objects are attracted to each other is not because of their mass um, and it has nothing to do with their weight. And, and this, this is another thing I can sort of talk about is that, first of all, you, you can't weigh an object that's floating in space. So people need to think about that. Like, you can only weigh an object that is actually resting on something. So you can weigh your body because you're resting on the earth and there's a ratio between y your density, or I should say your intensity, and the object known as the earth's intensity. So we can we can find that ratio, we call it weight. So if an object is just floating in space or it's in a sea of energy, you can't weigh it accurately because it's literally floating. So this is why you can't weigh, uh, you know, a bubble that's floating in water. It's because the bubble is so interconnected to the water because the water is its source that it's one and the same thing and this is again while I talk about intensity so it's hard to explain but but check out Robert Ortiz's book uh, called um, gravity is a myth electricity is the only force in the universe check that one out and then also check out Walter Russell Okay, so I'm going to call out Thornhill again. Um, I have much respect for him, so I'm not, I'm not bashing him. I think Thunderbolts is doing a good thing. But first of all, you can't measure the speed of a particle that doesn't exist. So you can't measure these smaller so-called particles that are inside of an electron because they don't exist in the first place. You might be measuring or sensing different wave uh, intensities and thinking that those are particles but but they're not and then the idea that something could be faster than the speed of light is kind of a moot point because if there is something fast, faster than the speed of light it is light itself it's only light that we can't sense or light that we can't see and this is like kind of like what dark matter is about it's like all this stuff that we can't instrumentize all the stuff that we can't sense and measure we give it these spooky names um, and we speculate on what it is and we create all these theories like chaos theory string theory um, shit quantum mechanics even and we create all these theories that are great in our mind they're just they're just not they're not verified in nature so we can't we can't actually see them in nature so they're they're just theories, and that's actually what Wallace is doing a good job of here in this in this talk. Is he goes through earlier in this talk, and he just pulls apart um, some of the fundamental fundamental basics of of uh, quantum mechanics and of particle theory and of Einsteinian and Newtonian uh, theory, and he just shoots them down like really well. So I I suggest you guys watch this this talk on its own. All right, moving on. Calculated that if those tiny little subparticles were to be released from the electron, they could travel from here to the far side of the Andromeda galaxy in one second. This comes back to Newton's law, which doesn't involve time. In other words, it says it's instantaneous. Well, that kind of speed is instantaneous on our scale, on a galactic scale. Okay, I gotta say it again. If something is instantaneous, and hopefully people will understand this. If something occurs 
instantaneously, it is not moving. Okay? Because in order for something to move, it has to travel across distance. Even if it's super fast, it's going from, from here to there. So if something's actually just appearing instantaneously, it's because it's always there. It's always been there. And it will always be there. The thing that's actually happening is our awareness is finally picking it up. It's finally being able to sense it. So, please kind of like, kind of think apophatically and be able to take some of the programming and paradigms that you, that you have or that people have in the material world and the material physics and shed some of the programming and like open up the mind and go, wait a second. Some of these definitions don't make any sense at all, like the ones I've pointed out. And then also that, like I said, if the universe is infinite, then it's everywhere always, always has been, always will be, because it's eternal. Eternity transcends time or temporal temporality. So anytime we see something in time, you could even say space because they're interrelated. They're relative to each other, which means they're related. They're relatives. They're family, right? So something that's relative only exists in time. Let me repeat that. Something that's relative only exists in time. Something that's real is eternal. And I know this sounds like spiritual talk, but even the mystics will say this, and they're, they're not talking about science, but they're talking about um, our awareness of science. Like, they're talking about our awareness of being. How do we know anything, right? Well, it has to be, it has to be something that we become aware of behind our eyes, like in our being. Otherwise, we, we can't even talk about it. There has to be something there that's sensing it. And this, this thing that's able to sense the cosmos at large is technically is eternal. It's infinite. And so just I'll repeat that. Anything that exists in relativity exists in time. And so it's illusory. It doesn't mean that it's not it's it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a realness to it, or it doesn't mean that it doesn't have truth involved. But it's just a perspective of truth or a perception of truth. And there's going to be a higher knowledge that's, that's actually um, manifesting or creating that, that truth. It's that higher knowledge that we need to tap into in order to understand ourselves and the universe. Because, I mean, ultimately we are one, right? Okay, moving on. Okay, last thing here. These are just these are just um, mathematical uh, calculations that these two guys are sort of not arguing over, but they have different calculations for the same thing. And my point here is that you can use math just like any language to describe whatever it is you're trying to describe. And what I would say in some of these these findings, like um, for example, Nassim Haramein finding, supposedly finding, you know, uh, the, measuring the radius of the Schwarzschild proton. These are these huge astronomical numbers that have all these, you know, 37 zeros behind them. What that actually is saying is that it's infinitely small. It actually keeps going into infinity so small that we can no longer detect it. So what that actually means, and think about this, is that when you have a number that's that, that's that large, it actually means it's, not a me it's actually an inaccurate number. It's a, it's a number that just goes on forever. So all it's saying is that 
there is no measurement for these little particles. And I'll say it one more time, the reason why there is no measurement for these particles is because they're trying to measure something that is not a particle. You're trying to measure a wave. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. Okay, thank you guys for listening. Um, please share. And I just also want to say um, that I respect Thunderbolts and I respect Wallace Thornhill and his team. And um, I'm not taking any of this stuff out of context, even though this is a small part of his talk. Um, I understand it and I know where he's coming from. So, you know, all you trolls out there, you know, don't try to say I'm taking things out of context. All right. Thank you very much.